Hello Trauma Thrivers, welcome back and today I am absolutely delighted to introduce you all to Dr. Jamie Marrick who I have, has been one of my heroes let's say for the last couple of years and particularly since I saw her in London present. So hi Jamie and thank you for joining us today. Hello, Lou. It's so marvelous to be here with you. Thank you for oh, having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's great to have you here. So for those of you that don't know Jamie, I'm sure you will get to know her. Um, she's a facilitator of transformative experiences, a clinical trauma specialist, an expressive artist, which we'll get her to talk more about. She's a writer. In fact, she's prolific. And one of the things I've got to ask her is how she's managed to write so many books when I haven't got to my first one yet, Jamie, even. Um, she's a yogini, a performer, a short filmmaker, a Reiki master, and she's also a big recovery advocate. And she unites all of those elements in her mission to inspire healing in others. And today, really, what I want to talk about as well is her uh, latest edition of Trauma and the 12 Steps. And oh my God, having read it, and it is marvellous, Jamie, I wish I'd had that in my early treatment journey when I was at the Priory in my 30s as an mm. addictions therapist. My God, that's going to be so beneficial for so many people. Thank you for that. And as you would have read in the book, and it's a kind of foundational story of the book, so much of what charged my interest in really trauma-informing addiction care was a horrible experience I had working in the first treatment center I was hired to work at. And I mean, I wouldn't say it was all around horrible because I did learn a lot of wonderful things and met very many interesting people there. And it really was the foundation of my professional journey. Yet I was just very outraged, really, that I saw them not addressing trauma. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons I had that source of outrage is because my first sponsor who brought me 12-step recovery uh, when I was living in Bosnia and, and doing aid work there, um, she, she was an American also uh, working in humanitarian aid, but had a lot of time in recovery. She was so trauma-informed in her approach. And not only was she the first person I met in my journey who validated that what I had was an addiction that could be treated, but she was also the first person who validated that unhealed trauma was so much a part of this puzzle that, that was keeping me stuck in life. And I, I still remember that day when I had a meltdown with, with the priest I was working with and he didn't know what to do with me. And she ended up saying to him, father, this, this is not, uh, you know, a young girl acting out. This is a post-traumatic reaction. Let me take yeah. it from here. Wow. And, and, and she did really getting me grounded after that interaction and then helped me to explore what trauma really means. Because uh, at that point, this was 2001, um, my understanding of it was, was people who went to war, yeah. uh, usually That's Vietnam good. vets was, was the connotation in the head. Yeah. And obviously we were doing aid work in a country that was only five years out of a civil war and uh, obviously dealing with the impact and fallout of that. So I was working around a lot of trauma, but then she asked me to consider, Jamie, have you thought about why you bond with these kids so much? Why you have that connection with them? And she yeah. said, war zones are subjective for people. She said, the war zone could have been your bedroom, your home. The war zone could be someone's neighborhood, their school, uh, depending on. So she was really, I think, very ahead of her time in terms of being able to normalize totally. what, what trauma is and, and expand its definition. And, and I was just so blessed to have a person that was so trauma savvy mentoring me in my early recovery. I believe it's the reason that I stayed sober yeah. and stayed around. And so when I came back to the U.S. to do graduate school, which is what she suggested of me, I, I was really kind of miffed, um, <laughs> upset to see that the trauma was either not being addressed at all, or it was something, oh, we deal with it later. Yeah. Uh, and, and so much of my experience, because also what was going on with me personally at the time, is I had been two years sober right around the time that I started my graduate internship training, which is preliminary to, to graduating here in the US. And I noticed that I was being very triggered, very activated, not 
by the children I was working with in this hospital, but by the way I saw the system treat the children, yes. the way I saw the doctors, the way I saw our, our social services agencies here treat the kids. And it again brought up not just a lot of unhealed trauma, but unhealed dissociation in me from earlier times in my life. And at that point is when EMDR therapy was introduced to me. And it was, again, another life-saving intervention uh, that, that really helped me thrive. I know your group is Trauma Thrivers. And, it is, because and, it and it was so important. Yeah, and it was the key that kind of got me past that survival point as a person yeah. in recovery and into thriving mode. And then within a year after that is when I started working in this very well-known treatment center and I could not understand why trauma wasn't being addressed. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear from my personal journey why this professionally fuels me so much. Yes, yeah, yeah. And when did you realize in your personal journey that you wanted to go into the profession and actually train in it and all the rest of it. Because I think that's a really interesting thing for us therapists. Well, honestly, Lou, I, um, if you told me when I was 18 or 19 years old that I'd be doing this for a living, I would have laughed at you. Yeah. Uh, my, my undergraduate course was actually in, uh, I have a degree in history and also a degree, it's, it's technically in English, but more the pop culture aspects of English. So Isn't together, it? so together with my history degree, I have a degree in something called American studies. And wow. I like to tell people I have a degree in pop culture and I had initially planned on going to graduate school for history, um, to, to become a professor. I, cause I, but I also had a lot of creative interests. I performed quite a bit as a kid. I was interested in film back then as well. Yeah. And I, I, I knew a couple psychology majors in college and I thought they were out of their gourd for wanting to study this. It frustrated me. I think I took yeah. two classes of psychology and it didn't interest me at all. And then, I mean, I, I got into this field through my personal journey is the short yeah. answer, but I do yeah. think there's a real fun story to it because as I mentioned, I, I was living in Bosnia Herzegovina, and I know it's more known to our European listeners. Uh, my family is actually Croatian, and so oh, I grew okay. up. I grew up with a really strong connection to my Croatian culture, especially what was going on in the war from yeah. ninety one to ninety five. Yeah. And so when I when I finished my undergraduate course in two thousand, I I literally did not know what I really wanted to do. As I said, I had started a graduate course in history, but I was not in a good place in my personal life, and I. I ended up in the throes of my own addiction, packing a backpack, taking some money I had saved, and I went to Herzegovina, the, the Croatian part of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I knew I could get a job teaching English. I knew I can get a job in humanitarian aid because there's a pretty strong religious presence in, in that part of the country. Yeah. And I it's sometimes recovering people will call it a geographical cure. And it was that at the time, because yeah. I thought, well, if I move 8,000 miles away and chill out for a while, yet it ended up being a move that, you know, my, my spiritual journey really needed because yeah. I ended up meeting Janet, this, this sponsor and this mentor. And before I was even formally sober, Lou, she handed me a meditation book that ended up being very transformational in my journey. And she wrote this inscription. I remember it was in September of 2001. And it said, God doesn't choose the qualified. He qualifies the chosen. Uh. And I didn't really know what that meant at the time. Just, yeah. oh, nice. You know, she, she wrote this in here for me. How cool. And then I ended up getting formally sober later that next year after kind of stumbling around with it for a while. And I literally decided on going into this field because Janet, my, my sponsor and the priest who I had the meltdown with, they thought I'd be good at it. And after I had about a year of, of sobriety, they, they, I don't think they were going to let me stay in Bosnia much longer because they yeah. like, go get your education. And, and yeah. Janet even said, you know, pursuant to her comment about the connections that I made to the kids there. Uh, she said, Jamie, you've learned so much of the art of what it means to heal trauma being here yes. and doing aid work following the war. Now go back and get your education. Yeah. And I remember when I first saw the graduate booklet 
before the Catholic college here in the U.S. that I came to, I, I remember seeing a big picture of the DSM on the cover of the booklet, along with some other textbooks. And I, what am I getting into? I, yeah. I had no idea. And I had a lot of challenges in my graduate program and in the internship, but that's what got me into EMDR therapy. Yeah, so exactly. I, I completely got into this field because somebody who knew me better than I knew myself at the time Said thought I would you. thought I would thrive at it. Yeah. yeah. And right now I can't see myself doing anything else. Yeah. So it is a real story and trusting the process. Yeah, isn't it just? And what's the PhD in? So my PhD is in it's technically in human services with a specialization in counseling. Oh, so wow. uh, yeah, clinically here in the U.S., I, I practice at my master's degree level in counseling, okay. Okay. and then the PhD I, I just got for bonus because I wanted to research EMDR. Yeah. And uh, my dissertation research, which was published in 2009, was specifically on how EMDR therapy can be used as part of addiction treatment, continuing care with women in recovery. Okay. And I mean, it was a real common sense thing for me to want to research because yeah. clearly I had a passion for it. And uh, yeah, the, the investigation I did, it was qualitative. So it was looking more at the why and the how, like okay. how did EMDR work? How was it implemented? Yeah. We weren't really doing like control group, treatment group. No. We, we had established um, that the center had successful outcomes with using EMDR with their women. And we wanted to talk to some of the women about how okay. that, that worked for them. So it ended up being just a real formational study for me, not only because it earned me my doctorate, but it really got me even further excited about EMDR therapy as a treatment yes. and uh, wanting to teach it to others. Yeah, which you now do very successfully. I do. In the oh, thank you. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So yeah, very, very, very special. Um, so going back to talking about EMDR and trauma and the book, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's really interesting to go back to kind of pre-2010 because I was at the mm. Priory in, God, 2003, four, I think I started mm -hmm. my addiction journey there and I was mm -hmm. there about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking back, I, I don't even really know whether in my early days as a therapist, I even really thought about trauma that much. We had somebody mm -hmm. coming in doing a trauma egg but actually mm -hmm. in those days, it was very much like treat the addiction first, then treat the trauma later. Mm -hmm. But I know in the book, amongst various other really mm -hmm. great things, that's not something that you advocate. And I wonder whether you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah. So let's explore a little bit of where that thinking came from. Yeah. So much of modern treatment, meaning late 20th century treatment, was really impacted by the founding of Alcoholics Anonymous and, yeah. and the 12 steps, which really was not the only model, but certainly the most popular model that was promoting this disease concept of addiction, yeah. that addiction yeah. was a primary treatable chronic progressive disease in and of itself, and that you might be muddying the water if you look too much at looking at root causes. And a lot of what AA loves to cite is this letter from Carl Jung that he wrote to Bill Wilson, the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, basically saying there was this case, this guy named Roland, who I unsuccessfully treated with psychoanalysis all these years. And it wasn't until he had a spiritual experience that he was able to finally get sober. So I think that's one of the documents that AA really cites and 12-step minded people kind of justifying that, yeah, if we get into too much of... The, the psychoanalysis and the details, we, we might be get, keeping people from seeing the, the core issue that's in front of them on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And I also cite in the book a really other well-known addiction psychiatrist here in America who long believed if he could get to the root cause with psychoanalysis, treating addiction, then he can eradicate what people what drove them to use. Right. And then he ended up telling the story of a man he treated with five years of psychoanalysis. He thought they were finally getting better. And then the man ended up dying of, of a binge. And he realized that by doing so much digging, he was giving the guy more excuses. Okay. And so I think that's long been, both of those stories explain some of the historical origin of why there's been this hesitancy to go there with trauma. Cause we don't, we either don't want to make them worse 
or we don't want to give them more excuses that yeah. looking at too much of the roots of trauma is just uh and then another story i tell in the book is from stephanie covington who is a a, a role model to me and just um, the the author of a woman's way through the 12 steps yeah. and really advanced this dialogue about trauma and addiction in the 80s and I heard her speak at a conference where she told the story of the first time she spoke on trauma at an addiction conference was circa 1982, 1983. And when she gave the talk, it was called something like sex and violence and addiction treatment. Her colleagues just stormed her at the end saying, how dare you talk about this? Our people aren't ready to go there. Wow. And what she heard in their resistance is them saying, we're not ready to go yeah, there. Yeah, totally. And that has been a lot of my experience in the treatment field, continuing to consult and, and work uh, indirectly with the treatment field, yes. is there's a lot of personal fear on the part of the clinician about going there. Because let's be clear, they've not done their own trauma work, yes. or they feel inadequately trained to really go there. And so I... I you know this, Lou, that so much of my approach is both and. I am definitely not anti-12 step. It's what helps save my life. I still work a program, albeit a more rebellious one. Uh, yet I also believe in the importance of trauma care. And as I told you, I had my deep journey with EMDR about two years sober. So that's another common resistance I hear is, well, you know, you had two years sober, you were stable, you were able to handle the trauma work. And yes, that's very true. But I would also say in the two years prior to that, I was working with somebody who was still trauma informed. Yes. And so a common anthem that I hear in a lot of treatment centers is something like, well, we can't work with trauma. We have to shut it down because we don't have the time or the resources to go there. And yes, that may be very true. However, what you have is a lot of power to still be trauma informed yes. in how you run your treatment center and how you do groups. So for example, groups really need to be based on building skills to help yeah. people regulate affect and stay in their affective window of tolerance, not just talking for two hours. Yeah. And a lot of that talking stirs up stuff. And then if something traumatic gets mentioned, it's like, I, I, you can't go there, but then all this affect has been churned. Yeah. So that's an example of how we can be trauma informed in the delivery of addiction treatment without maybe doing the most. And so I guess what I'm getting at here is there's a lot of myths about what trauma work entails. People okay. think it has to be kind of going to the jugular, going to the source. And while I think that's helpful, and for many cases needs to happen sooner rather than later. Yeah. Uh, there needs to be a larger understanding here that from the moment a person walks into a treatment center, you can be doing trauma work with them by simply yeah. validating their experience. Yes, totally. By, by giving them skills to work with distress at the level of the body. Yeah, yeah. And also giving them the understanding, which maybe wasn't around when we both started, about how much of it is a somatic process. Correct. Yes. You know. Because so much of addiction treatment is top down, yeah. outside in. Yeah. And I want to be clear again, that's not all bad because trauma means wound. That's the core of how I teach on trauma, that if you yeah. understand that trauma means wound, it's any unhealed wound, this gives you a lot of your logic that wounds often need to be stabilized for sure before they can heal. You may need to wash them out, put a bandage on it, stitch it. Yeah. But then eventually after the initial bleeding stops, it's going to need some air and yeah. true healing happens from the inside out. And so, I mean, a common person I cite, as I think a lot of us do, is Bessel van der Kolk in The Body Keeps the Score. And he references how outside in healing uh, would be things like talking, connecting with others, psychoeducation. Yes. And those are exactly how I would define what goes on in AA, what goes on in treatment. And yes, those are still important. But I think, unfortunately, those are all we give people sometimes. Yeah. And it ends up just being a rebandaging, a rebandaging, a rebandaging of the wound. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, yeah, let's, let's get some initial stabilization, but admit that there's even a wound there in the first place. Yeah. To me, that's part of being trauma-informed in, in kind of entry-level addiction treatment. Yeah. And, and uh, 
Go ahead. I love the part in your book where you said about big, the difference between, and I think it's interesting in trauma thrivers, we've got mm -hmm. uh, 50, 50, I would say mix 50% clinicians, but 50% mm. lay people or survivors. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to make sure that they understand that, that, that everybody understands what we're talking about. But when we say, big T trauma versus little mm -hmm. T trauma, you know, the small T traumas are the ones that are really affect us too. And I wonder whether mm -hmm. you, you know, you see that too in your work. Yeah. So yeah, just as a little shout out to Dr. Shapiro who created EMDR, she yeah. was the one who gave us that language originally. Yes. That big T traumas are things we tend to associate with the PTSD diagnosis and little T or small T traumas are everything else. Now, interestingly, even she moved away from that language in later years. Did she? And she went, and she went more to the language of adverse life experiences that may or may not qualify you for a diagnosis yeah because i think that's really where the hang-up is for a lot of people well you know i don't have a ptsd diagnosis i and and the reality is unhealed trauma can show up in a variety of different ways yeah. it can show up in other diagnoses it can show up just in kind of general things that get in the way of your life. So yeah. I do think the big T, small T language can still be useful as an explanatory device for, yeah. for some of our clients. But I do like that she moved away from that because she has always said in her teaching that these smaller traumas can be just as clinically significant yeah, totally. as the bigger stuff. And if you understand this idea of the wound, that's very clear. Yeah. That if a wound festers, if a wound infects, even if it seems rather innocuous, it's going to continue to cause problems. Yeah. And if it's never aired, I mean, some of the yes. wounds that I hear, and I mean, my own personal wounding, if it's never spoken about, if it's mm -hmm. never acknowledged, if it's never heard, I mean, yes. you, that the wound does just fester, doesn't it, away? Mm -hmm. And, you know, with a lot of people that I work with too, unfortunately, that complex PTSD diagnosis is still not fully in the dsm-5 is it yet so it's not i mean the icd-11 has gotten on board and my understanding is whatever text iteration is going to happen next with the dsm they're they're looking at it but you know i think it's so important that we talk about complex ptsd because it recognizes that for so many survivors it's not just one event yes that the ptsd diagnosis that was as it was written in 1980 and as it's written now is very event-centric Totally. It's very, well, this is the one thing that happened to you in the fallout. And yeah, for a lot of people, it is one thing that happens and there's fallout. Yeah. But even folks who have a, a one-time event, there's usually complicating events that precede it. And I'm thinking of medical trauma as a huge example of that, mm -hmm. that you can have an initial injury, but so many people feel traumatized by the interdealings, the inner workings they have to have with the medical system and having multiple surgeries and... And, and that is just a pure example of a compounding effect, even with PTSD. Yeah. Yet so much of what we're getting out with complex PTSD is this idea of a developmental origin, yeah. that it's something that starts early, uh, that the injuries can have more of a day in, day out quality, and yeah. can be especially pervasive when it's somebody who is supposed to care for you. Totally. That is doing the wounding towards you. Yeah. I agree. So, so what would you like the recovery community or, or the addiction field to kind of take from the book is really in essence, is it mm -hmm. that, you know, we need to have that trauma dialogue, that conversation earlier, you know, we need to signpost people correctly. Is it that kind of thing that you'd like to see more of? You know, it's a great question. And as you were asking it, the thing that most came up for me viscerally is as a field, we have to be less afraid about working with trauma. Yeah. And that starts with our willingness to do our own work with it. Yeah. Because even in addiction treatment centers where people are restricted because they only have so much time to work with clients or they're working within a model, I still see some good work being done. And I believe I was able to do this good work because I was not afraid of trauma. Yeah, I was not afraid to validate people or go there with them while also setting appropriate boundaries that we may not have the time to, to get into all of this. Yeah. 
So I think the key is do whatever you have to do to not be afraid of it. And I don't think the necessary answer is always more training, although training can be helpful. And I mean, I make a living doing training. So I, I think I'm a pretty unbiased person here to say, hey, maybe patronizing a trainer isn't the best thing, but getting your own trauma treatment may be yeah. a better expenditure of your money. Uh, and, and I would love to see treatment centers in the addiction field, and even the mental health field, where we promote that more as a norm. I mean, I think, as you know, Lou, I'm pretty out with my own diagnoses, things yeah. I've struggled with. I mean, I've talked about my addiction journey here, my dissociation journey, yeah. and that is still considered uh, kind of controversial in you some know, areas. Uh, and I, that I, very it, much upsets me. Yeah, it upsets me too, um, because I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm more like you, particularly for a Brit. I'm probably more mm. American in, in my soul. <laughs> I'm quite out there as well, and I share my story, and I even share my traumas. Um, you know, and, and I think the feedback I've always got is if it's in the client's interest, it's helpful. Yeah. And I was so touched at the end science day that you did, mm. that you came on stage and you shared something of self. And Thank that you. makes such a difference. And I will say in credit to the British people, at least the British people that I've trained, because when I started training in the UK, no, no, I mean, yeah. I, I had a bit of, oh gosh, how are the English going to receive me? Because I can be very American. I mean, I also, I lived in Europe, so I think I have a little of that sensibility too. But yeah, yeah I mean, the, 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 the British kind of temperament is known as being like, hold it all in. But I will yeah. tell you, I have had nothing but warm reception that's from good. when I've taught in the UK, even more than I get in the US most times. Yeah, and so I think good. that I think that tells me that British clinicians know that holding it in isn't going to help. It's not yeah. helped your yeah. countrymen. It's not helped the people you work with. And no. I've just seen a real willingness. Um, I mean, I've trained for our common friend Mark Brain several times, and for N Science. And I, I debuted my Power of Process Dissociation course in the UK, wow. uh, which is very personal. And I, I had a marvelous experience okay, teaching good. it with the that's, East Anglia group. Yeah, so that's I think, lovely to and, hear. And, and I, I, I point this out to show that I think this is a problem all around the world, that there's yeah. a, either a willingness to go there with trauma or there's not. Yeah. And it, when I've taught in the UK, I've been put in front of some amazing audiences of people who really want to go there with yeah. helping others address trauma. And sometimes when I teach in the US, especially to more addiction specific audiences, it's just like, yeah, because you know, it's so much of what Stephanie, you know, identified. There's that unwillingness to go yeah, there. Yeah, and I, and I kind of I, I I kind of hear you, but I I also reflect and in myself and think back to my first decade. I mean, this is my coming up two decades in this industry. I don't mm. know whether I'd have been ready fully to go there because a lot of my EMDR and my trauma journey happened as layers, and you know. Yeah going there within myself, it, it wasn't in the first five years of me being a therapist. Right. So let me speak to that because I actually speak to that in the book. Yeah. Because um, I'm being honest. I think it's a kind it's of- It's beautiful process. honesty. Yeah. And I do believe there's such a thing as people not being ready, but I tend to have, I, I don't like the word ready anymore. Yeah. And I used it a lot in my early career as, as a clinician. But I think it's more of, okay, so if a person's not ready, what are we doing to help get them prepared? Yeah. And inspired by my EMDR journey and, and the, the phase of preparation, I, I like to replace the word readiness with preparedness. Yeah. So if people are saying they're not ready, I, I will say, okay, I hear that. I, I hear that you're there. Yet if you have these goals, uh, assuming that I'm letting them lead by, by goals, I, it's... I, I have to ask them and begin to explore what are we doing to help get you prepared? Yeah. And so I hope people who work in initial treatment can draw some inspiration from that, that initial treatment is preparation time. Yeah. That yes, you might be limited in time and scope with what you can do, but it is still a time to prepare people for maybe a deeper journey they're going to take ahead. I agree. And you can do that with an understanding of what has to come ahead. Yeah, I agree. I hear you. And haven't you developed a process for that? 
um, with Adam O'Brien. Is there something that you've developed yeah. that the model called addiction and dissociation? I was reading. Yeah, oh, I'm not happy to, to talk about, about that. that. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do give a little overview of it in the book, and it's something Adam and I will be exploring. Yeah, uh, more more further uh, later, and we're doing some academic writing on it right now. So. Uh, Adam is somebody that I've mentored through his EMDR training journey, and he now works as, as a team member for my training group. And uh, one of the reasons he was drawn to my work is because of my connection with addiction and dissociation. And he also identifies as a person in, in long-term recovery. Yeah. And so one of his initial working ideas that we have honed a little bit is this idea that addiction is a dissociative expression. Totally. And I think that's common sense to a yeah. lot of us who know addiction and trauma both, but we're kind of directly getting it out there and, and saying it. So and, much more 21st century than the word denial. Right, right. And a, and a, a dissociation, I, I always love dropping knowledge on people about what dissociation means. All it means is to sever or to separate. Right. And so you could also look at dissociation as it's the opposite of mindfulness. It's the opposite of being in the here and now. Yeah. And, and, you know, so much of my story was that I dissociated so much as a child. Did you? Uh, I was, I was often told things like, Jamie looks like she's been hit in the head with a fastball or, you know, Jamie, are you here? Are you here? And, and I had a very active imagination and, and, and that was a good thing as a kid. It really kept me survived in a lot of yeah. ways, but I also had this tendency to zone out and check out and just make myself leave the room. And then once I was introduced to chemicals, it amplified that already familiar experience. Yeah. Thanks. And so my experience, I think, is pretty common that at about two years of recovery, and for a lot of people, it manifests a lot sooner than that. I think it did in me too. I had enough skills to at least keep it managed, but uh, there's this sense of your primary dissociative mechanism, meaning the chemical or the reinforcing behavior is no longer there anymore. Yeah. So you have a tendency to, that dissociation is still there at the root. So uh, yeah, and, and part of where we're going with this model is that trauma treatment has to, I mean, addiction treatment rather, has to be not only trauma informed, but dissociation informed. Yes. And a lot of what that means, Adam and I wrote an article on this, basically, uh, kind of like the fundamentals of dissociation and forming addiction treatment, realizing that when you're in groups, for instance, in group therapy, if a person is being disrespectful or checking out or nodding off, it may not be disrespect. It could no. be that they're overwhelmed. Yes. Uh, especially because we often don't attend to good group hygiene and there's so much cross triggering and cross pollination of traumatic experiences going on. So that's part of what I mean that group therapy really, I think there's still a lot of value to group, but I think it tends to get misused yeah, in addiction exactly. centers and having a, a core understanding of dissociation can help us move in a better direction there. And also that old school addiction kind of mentality where, you know, I was still of, of the day where we used to hand out pamphlets with things like King Baby. <laughs> King Baby, yes. As soon as you yeah. said pamphlet, I went to King Baby. <laughs> How could you not? And, and think that that was okay. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. It's just <laughs> mind-blowing. That took me now. back, yep. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sure there's others that I can think of that would, yeah. So you, yeah. you're both going to, will you train professionals in that model? That you're well, developing? Adam, yeah. Adam now has a specified training for EMDR therapists that they can take on it. And yeah, Amazing. we're hoping to do a presentation at a conference at some point next year. It may be online now with, with everything. And yeah, and I could send you the link to the yeah. blog we have about it with the that core of the model. Really and it's it's also outlined in the new book in Trauma and the 12 Steps. Yeah. If I may, I just want to flash up a copy uh, of Trauma yeah. and the 12 Steps. We this will be flashing, talking about. Yeah, we will yeah. be flashing that all up all over the place. My, my latest child, so to speak. Yeah, so. well, I think it's so important to bring the two together. And also because you're right, the 12 Steps, for me, I mean, 
so many of my clients I recommend 12 steps to and even if there's no substances right you know if there's trauma there's still ACOA there's still mm -hmm. CODA for people that don't know about the 12 steps that are listening ACOA is adult child of alcoholics mm -hmm. and CODA means codependency so mm -hmm. many people don't they with trauma have relational issues so those groups are really helpful yes. just to kind of have some contact with people again and 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 yeah and and have some trust and some relationships and the power of group processes yes and i think the importance of of if if you are paired with somebody who's good to guide you like i was with janet yeah, the importance it. of daily lifestyle change you know, she really worked with me on these are the things you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis or the things that i'm recommending you do on a day-to-day -day basis i mean she's the one who got me into the habit of doing meditation every morning okay. um, going to a certain amount of meetings keeping a journal or what was called like a god box at the time where yeah. you were kind of tangibly turning things over yeah um and a lot of my my clients who are not in a 12-step program or only have trauma a, as their kind of core presentation i often wish i had a 12-step program to send them to and very I often know. i do i do send the i do at least expose them to the 12 steps yeah because um, i think especially if some of the language can be tweaked for them it, it might give them a path of these are some things I could do on a day-to-day -day basis. Because yeah. a lot of the steps, even though we talk about working the steps, uh, things like the third step, the seventh step, you, you can work the 10th step, especially, you can work those, the 11th step on a daily basis. Yeah. And um, I know I do. Yeah, and what I'm gonna do for the people that aren't stepped informed is bring up now all the 12 steps as we're speaking so that they can see what the 12 mm -hmm. step model is. Because I know that you've got in the book as well about if you're agnostic or atheist mm -hmm. or anything, lots of people unfortunately don't realize that the steps were written, what, 150 years ago or uh, over? Oh, not quite that long ago. Uh, 1930, 1939 okay. is the version we have now. Yeah, okay. 1939. So 80 ish years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty archaic, some of the language. And a lot of my oh, yeah. clients go, oh my God, it's got the word God in it. So, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get people's heads around, it's not a religious program, it's right. a spiritual program. And I know you really go into that in the book. Yeah, I have a new chapter on spiritual diversity because in, in fairness, a lot of fellowships and a lot of treatment centers have promoted a little bit more of dogmatism around it because the, the phrase used in the steps is God is as I understand him. Yeah. And I even take it a step further in my book saying, if you need to change that pronoun, change that pronoun because I yeah. use feminine pronouns nowadays when I talk about God. Yes. Uh, so I, I allow in how I work the steps with people to have even more permissiveness in the language and the flexibility yeah. Um, because yeah, they, they, they were written I, on one hand, we can say they were written by old white privileged men in the 1930s, and the language does reflect some of that archaicness. But, you know, and they were wounded and they had issues. But I think a lot of what we do need to give them credit for is as men, it was not easy for them to do things like talk about feelings. No. And they really stumbled into this power of one person helping another. And, and yeah. through that, kind of initial crucible is where the language of the steps was created. But yeah. I'm very, I'm very permissive with people. And and I do think there's been a long history in some AA groups and other 12 step groups and treatment centers of not being very kind to people yeah. who identify as atheist or agnostic. And I really make a direct call in the book that that has to stop. Yeah. Uh, because so many people I know who have fine recovery whether it's within 12 steps or not, can do it without God or a spiritual force. Yeah. And I've learned a lot from listening to them yes. about how they do it. Yeah. So there's many roads to Rome and there's never one model or way or theory or yes. is there? And, uh, you know, I Correct. think that's what we both promote. Mm -hmm. So for you now and the future of trauma treatment and, and what you'd like to see and recovery and where, where are you heading next in your amazing journey so far? Well, I think for me personally, I, I've spent over a decade now really trying to educate people about being more trauma aware, trauma informed in their work. I, I do think in this next phase, I'm going, going even more into 
dissociation informing care. Yes. Because I do think there's a lot of myths and misunderstanding about dissociation as a manifestation of trauma that really pervade. Yes. Uh, and I also am a lot more emboldened to talk about what I've talked with you about today, which is challenging professionals to do your own trauma work, that that yeah. might actually help you better than any professional training at yes. this point. Yes. Uh, that that's really where we're so much of, I think, how we're going to heal the world. And I, I mean, there, there are, I don't want to say that this is anything new because it's been happening for quite some time. I just think we're more acutely aware of it now with racial injustice and tension. And it's, it's very much on my heart and soul here yeah. as an American. Yes. And so many of the great thinkers and leaders of color that I've talked to in the last several weeks have really just emphasized the key here is trauma healing. Yes. That the world is not going to be a better place for people of color until white people heal their own trauma first. Totally. And I really, really believe that. And, and yeah. I continue to be an ambassador for Heal Thyself wherever you're at in your journey. And by doing that is, is how we will change the world. But I think as professionals, a big part of that has to be, we can help to minimize the stigma by coming out ourselves yeah. to really move past this us versus them wall that, that we have set up yeah. in so many factions of our professions. Uh, the it's, hierarchy, it's time for that wall to fall. <laughs> yeah, the hierarchies have got to go, haven't they? Yes. Because that you know there is no hierarchical structure, mm -hmm. and you know I think that that the time is now, and this is this is leading us towards a world that knows it's got to go deeper within and do that trauma work mm -hmm. on whomever yes. it is, you know, mm -hmm. and and. It's an ongoing journey. It doesn't end. And I know that you're doing some work about Healing Tree. That looks like an amazing charity yes. that you support too. Yeah, yeah. So Healing Tree is a wonderful charity here in the U.S. It was founded by a mother-daughter, Marissa and Debbie Gavami. And Marissa had her own experience with uh, complex trauma. Okay. And was really just kind of repulsed when she first saw it healing and treatment, how trauma ill-informed a lot of psychiatric care was and, and yeah. mental health care was, and then was just grateful to be connected to very trauma-sensitive providers. And yeah. just as, as somebody who's a survivor herself and, and her mother who stepped along in the journey with her, um, really just felt empowered to try to do something about it. So Healing Tree stands for trauma. Uh, oh, I always get the acronym mixed up, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's trauma recovery, and trauma resources for empowerment okay. and missing the other E. Yeah. Uh, I should probably know that since I'm on their board of advisors. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, yeah. so a couple, a couple years ago, I, I met Marissa through some common contacts and she asked me because of my position, if I would be on their advisory board. And I really liked what they were doing because Marissa's an actress. She's okay. a voiceover artist as well, who actually did the voiceover for the audiobook oh, wow. of Trauma and the 12 oh, Steps. Fun. Yeah, Fantastic. which is out now July 28th. Because okay. uh, I, I was talking to her on the day that uh, I realized I was getting an audiobook. And she said, you know, I have a demo reel. And I'm like, oh, I would love for you to be oh, the one who reads this. Right. Because you know trauma and, and yes. you, know, you know this work. Uh, so yes, I, I just love them as an organization. They've ended up supporting uh, getting EMDR training in place for um, some therapists who work with children who might not right. be able to normally afford the full price of a yeah, training. That's amazing. And the, the organization just has a lot of mission for getting people in place uh, yeah. to get further trained. And I like that Marissa does work with so many artists, uh, yeah. actress, yeah. actors, uh, musicians, yeah. people who are really willing to speak out. And yes. I think that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to work with them more than any other organization. Because I believe if we are really going to heal trauma at a societal level, it's more than just the professionals that have to do it, yeah. that we have to work together with people in other professions. And, and I mean, you know, so much of my belief as an expressive artist, expressive arts therapist is that the arts heals in yeah, so many arts. levels. Yeah. And, and you do, of I, course, your dancing and your yes. yoga and your Reiki mm -hmm. and everything else and other expressive arts. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I suppose I wanted to end by asking, how have you always been such a thriver? 
because it seems to me that you've, for the last two decades, throughout your trauma, even though you've had trauma, you've been able to really thrive. What would you say to people? Because I, I, I know for me personally, trying to find my voice took me to, you know, mm-hmm. four decades. So I just wonder how, Jamie, you've done that. Because it is it is amazing. I take my hat off to you. I think it's incredible. Thank you. It's a great question. Oh, what a great question. I, I think my gut level answer is yes, I thrive in a lot of areas of my life but other areas of my life are still works in progress. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. yeah. I've been divorced twice Have as you? a person. You've as been a person, married. You've been married. Yes, I've yeah, been married. I've been married and divorced twice. Okay. Even as a person in recovery who knew all the red flags about both relationships I was getting into and I'm still trying to sort it out. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's an area and I'm reminded of a good friend of mine who's, who's no longer with us and said, I think our relational area can be the last part of our lives to heal. Yeah. Because for so many of us, they were the first parts to yeah. get wounded. Yeah. So, I mean, that's an area where I'm, I'm still really working at it. Yeah. Um, you yet, and like, both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like with, with the arts and with, and with my work and with my friendships, I mean, with travel, there's just so much in life I've learned how to enjoy and to embrace. And I think how I've done it has been a combination of good support, yeah. good support, people who can both validate me and challenge me and love me as I am and show compassion, even for those rough edges. So good support has made the difference. Uh, For me, having an artistic practice, having a spiritual practice has helped to have an outlet. Because Lou, the more and more I've done this work, both for myself and for others that I work with, I'm convinced it's not our feelings that cause us problems. That actually it's when people stuff feelings is when they can't move forward, when they can't thrive. But learning these various outlets to express what I need to express, to feel what I need to feel and realize there will still be people there who will love me anyway. Uh, And that's taken some trust exploration to find those people in my life. Um, That's, that's what the key has been. And I've just been very blessed to, this is why, you know, my higher power knew what they were doing, taking me to Bosnia to get sober. They did because they did. I, I know I think I was on a track. Yeah. Uh, where ha- had I stayed the course, I don't think I would have lived past my twenties personally. Yeah. But you know, being a rather smart kid in school, I could have become a, a medical doctor or a lawyer or worked at, as a, like a tenured professor in some field, and I would have been this alcoholic, miserable mess. <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just very grateful that I was taken there because yeah. having these children as my teachers really helped me to get a greater sense of perspective on life and to realize that it is a both and that on one hand, my suffering is valid and it deserves to be treated and addressed. But on the other hand, it gave me the perspective that there are always people out there who have it worse. Yeah. And being able to have that perspective is something I'm so grateful for. And I believe that's why I'm here and thriving with you today. Well, we are very, very grateful for you and all that you do in the field and for being here today and for it being so delightful to have a conversation with you. And I hope we have many more and I'm also delighted that you're in the Trauma Thrivers Group and anything that we can do to support you or help heal trauma, I'm on a mission with you. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate it. All right, lovely to see you. 